This is the big picture, an official television report of the United States Army, produced for the armed forces and the American people. The date, the morning of November 8, 1957, at Huntsville, Alabama. A sudden meeting has been called by General John B. Medeiros, Commanding General of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. Good morning, gentlemen. Be seated, please. I have a very important announcement for you. We've been assigned the mission of launching a scientific Earth satellite. And we will use the Jupiter-C configuration as a carrier that we developed along with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. Let's go, Werner. This is what they've been waiting for. The deadline is 90 days. 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. A crash program, an emergency. And the American people had become aware of that emergency long before, when a Soviet Sputnik beep beeped its way across the skies. The reaction was one of astonishment and concern, for it was now known that a potential enemy was at least temporarily ahead in developing means for space travel. Reaction, counter-reaction. ABMA was a crack team headed by old pros of the missile field. Dr. Werner von Braun, director of the Development Operations Division, supervised over 3,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians with more years of practical experience than any similar group elsewhere. The decision was passed down. Modify the Redstone ballistic missile, the Army's most powerful weapons carrier over a 200-mile range. Why the Redstone? It had proved itself again and again on the ABMA launching pads at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Meanwhile, far across the country at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a sprawling 80-acre research and development complex in Pasadena, California, scientists and engineers were racing toward the same deadline, 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. Their job, furnish the high-speed upper stages to take over after the first stage powered the satellite to the prescribed distance from the Earth. As is so often said in the Army, but rarely with more accuracy, this was it. Minutes click past relentlessly. The beams of powerful searchlights light up the missile. Truly the star of one of the greatest suspense dramas of our time. The drama approaches the final act. The Army's first attempt to fire a man-made moon into orbit. Time, late evening, Friday, January 31st, 1958, in a blockhouse at Canaveral. The countdown to Explorer 1. Roger. Okay, we'll start now. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Fire command. Fire command. command. Fire command. The missile is in flight, but the success of its mission is still in doubt. It will take another hour and a half to know whether the satellite is in orbit, the most tense and harrowing wait of all. About midnight, not far from the now empty launching pad, General Medeiros finally called his assistant, Colonel Leonard Orman. Hello, Len. You can send this off to the secretary. That our satellite is definitely on orbit. Now get that off, and then I'll give you the figures in a few minutes. Okay, boy. 
20 minutes later, Dr. Porter opened the question and answer session by introducing three of the key men in the success story of Explorer One. Uh, the question is, has any form of life been placed in the satellite? I think I could answer that one almost myself. Not intentionally. <laughs> Maybe we have a Florida cockroach in time, we don't know. Everybody welcomed the touches of humor, for it was, after all, an hour of jubilation. Just one more came the inevitable plea from the photographers, and exhausted as they were, the trio obliged with what was to be the page one spread in newspapers all over the world. In plain language, the United States was in the space business along with the Russians, and Explorer One was the beginning.